Hi everyone, it's Elia Nichols from Florence, Italy. I'm a public speaking and communication coach. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hi, Terry. Hi, how are you? I'm calling in from Park City, Utah, and I'm very excited to bring you another Bringing Your World Together with COVID-19 from the United States to Italy. And our special guest today is Dr. Sitford, Christopher Sitford, founder of Black Bag Global Emergency Medicine. And yes, his last name is the same as mine because he is my brother-in-law. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> and Chris. Uh, Hi, Christopher. We we'll we'll, we'll hold that against you, Terry. Hi, Elliot. Thank How you. are you? I'm good. Thanks for doing this for yeah, Thanks us, for joining Chris. us. Yes. My pleasure. And for the audience, uh, Chris will just giving, be giving us some updates on COVID-19, and you'll be able to ask him some questions. So please send your comments into chat so that hopefully after his presentation, he, he can answer some of your questions. I'd like you to know just a little bit more about Dr. Sidford. He's highly regarded by peers and patients alike. He is a board certified physician in emergency medicine with over 20 years experience at leading medical institutions. Before founding Black Bag, he was an attending physician with the world renowned Leahy Clinic. He started his career at Boston City Hospital where he graduated from the hospital's Knife and Gun Club the residency program for emergency physicians. A U.S. Navy officer, Dr. Sitford served as faculty member of the emergency medicine residency program in San Diego before traveling overseas. The Mojave Desert and the Arctic Circle were just some of the locations that challenged Dr. Sidford to teach and practice emergency medicine in remote and difficult conditions. Later, he helped to open a nuclear chemical and Biological Proof Hospital on the island of, yes, Sicily, Italy. Upon returning to the United States, <laughs> he joined the faculty of Brown University, where he taught emergency medicine and served as attending physician at Rhode Island Hospital and Hasbro Children's Hospital. <laughs> wow. It's wow. impressive, Chris. You've had so, nine lives. You're a cat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's brought you here to be with us today. And I know that you've been working um, constantly since the COVID-19 broke out. And I know you've been staying up on everything. So I'd like you just to share with the audience kind of where we're at and what, what, what you know. Well, thank you very much, you guys. It's a pleasure to join you. And it is a little hard getting introduced by your sister-in-law, I have to say. Keeping a straight <laughs> face is a little challenging. <laughs> Uh, nearly, so we'll go from there. Okay. So I'm going to share the screen, and I'm just going to start with some slides and and go over a discussion. And then I'd love to get people's questions and interruptions. So feel free to jump in and ask questions that applies to anybody. So this is just a little bit of background about COVID-19. I think everybody is probably um, completely overwhelmed at times of what what we're dealing with. So I wanted to do just a little bit of a summary of what this actually is, go through what the treatments are, go through what are still recommendations, and then at the end we'll update some of the things we're doing now and where we might be headed. So this is a reminder to everybody that, that's, that COVID-19 actually is a coronavirus, of which the, the majority are common colds that we deal with all the time, and any of us who have kids, they carry this most of the winter, we've all had some degree of it. This is obviously different because it, it came out of Wuhan and it, and it is a type that we've never seen before and can be quite serious. As we all would know, it probably uh, it affects the, the lungs and our respiratory system and can be completely overwhelming and unfortunately lethal. Those are the symptoms we know of, fever, cough, we feel lousy and so on, but some of the sort of strange symptoms, one of which is if you lose your sense of smell or taste, that's one of the early warning signs that you may have COVID-19. And one of the other ones we found is something called COVID toes, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. But these are symptoms that we typically deal with and expect from people. So um, the, the unfortunate part about the loss of smell means that you might have contracted it, and then it's important to follow what symptoms you have. People mm -hmm. who get this tend to infect about three people and maybe more for everyone who gets this. And you tend to get symptoms somewhere between two and 14 days after being exposed. And the important part is that it has to do with what's called viral load. If you're next to somebody who has no symptoms, but they're shedding early in their course of illness, you get a small load, if any, that may be contagious. If you're a healthcare worker and you're doing a procedure on someone, you may get a very large viral load and then you become sick very quickly. 
Um, mm. As it's down here, it does affect kids and something that would appear to them to be a common cold, maybe COVID-19. So what you're saying about this load is that basically like if your immune system is strong enough and it, you come into contact with it, you're, you're the asymptomatic person out there, right? Where you, you come into contact, but nothing develops. If your immune system is not strong enough or you come into contact too often, like the nurses and doctors do, then it can develop into a full-blown coronavirus case. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, so you hit on two big points there. It could be the fact that you are healthy and that's the only illness you are going to have, or it may be that you're early, you don't have real symptoms, but you're still shedding. So it's hard to differentiate, and there's a lot of discussion in the literature and research on trying to figure out who in that clinical picture is the people we have to worry about. And basically, mm -hmm. we have to worry about everybody. So it could be you're healthy, and you're going to be absolutely fine, or it could mm -hmm. be that it's early on, and we just don't know. Okay. So going back to just a, the kind of a comparison, because a lot of people have sort of heard that maybe this has something that's similar to flu, but it really is not like flu. Flu is a, is a serious illness that can be dangerous to every winter, but this has a, has a completely different context to it. So flu typically infects about 1.3 people every time you get sick. So if you get sick and then you infect another person or 1.3 people, then down the road, after that happens 10 times, it means 13 people have been infected from one of you. As opposed to if you're, if the COVID-19 can affect somewhere between three and maybe up to six people, it means you infect somebody, they infect three people, they each infect three people. So when that happens 10 times, you're up to 60,000 people. And that's what's so dramatically different. And that's why this disease has taken on such a uh, strong hold in the, in the world is that it's so contagious and so easily spread. Right. And unlike SARS, when SARS showed up, people who got sick were then contagious. Here you can be contagious way before you get sick. Um, I think huh. people have known probably heard some of the risk factors, which I'll go over. But a couple of ones that are worth knowing is that being overweight, unfortunately, is one of the big risk factors for severe disease. Mm. Smoking and vaping are important things because they're irritants to the lung, and they mean that you can be more susceptible to catch COVID-19. And the other one, which is kind of a disturbing one, is that if you are in an area where the pollution count is very high, even a slight uptick in the pollution count, you can be 15 times more likely to die of, of the COVID-19 just by chronic exposure to pollutants. Wow. So a couple of things that, I'll, that, are, that are probably the most important take homes from today. Can I interrupt you on that, Chris? That's really interesting because, because China obviously was the first place that had, you know, where it came from. And then Milan was struck. And those are two of the smoggiest cities in the world. I mean, do you feel right. like that truly has a direct, direct relation to the reason there were so many cases? Well, the same goes with New York City, and it's the same. People are trying to figure out why are such areas like that so devastated, and in areas that are similar, like southern Italy or even a couple states away from New York, are not as severely affected. Right. And that's one of the theories, is that people have underlying lung disease. The other one has to do with wow. how compact they are, living spaces, and so on. I mean, New York City is, unfortunately, the perfect setup. Well, of course. Yeah. yeah, as is Milan, Absolutely. any big city, any big right. city is, right. Right, and it's clearly been around well in advance of what we've known about. So we thought maybe it was here in late February, maybe March. It really was here in probably late December, and early January. And mm -hmm. in fact, the same day it showed up in South Korea is the same day it showed up in the United States. And we, they went left and we went right, and we made, a, unfortunately, a number of, of I'll, I'll put it nicely, miscalculations that have missed a chance to stop or at least blunt the effect of this. I do think it's interesting how um, so many people have, are now saying how they think they had it a long time ago. And, you know, I was one of those two and we just didn't have enough tests to find out if, if that's what we had. And I, I just, I know you could probably go on and on about that, but um, I do, do you think that's probably part of the problem that we just didn't have enough testing? Well, it's one of the big differences that, that South Korea did, is they found out about it early. They got all the heads of state. They got the heads of, of manufacturing. They said, we need to test this. We need to track it. So they were very good at testing it. They used the World Health Organization's test. And then they were very good at tracking who got it and where it went. 
And that, unfortunately, and, and you and I have had a number of conversations about uh, relatives and family and people we work with and how do we know who to be careful with. And, and unfortunately, without adequate testing, we're, we really don't know. I don't know. Exactly. I mean, do you have any, we might be jumping ahead here, but will checking for antibodies be helpful for the future regarding who, who to know, you know, who to stay away from, which is a horrible concept, but, and who to know, you know, you can, you can not worry so much about, even the workforce. Well, there's two sides to that question. Um, it, it would always be nice to know if you had antibodies. And it's likely that anybody who's truly been sick will develop antibodies and that they'll be useful. The challenge is that we can't translate, we haven't been able to detect, if you have the antibodies, does that mean that you can't get sick again? And mm -hmm. that we don't know yet. It's assumed that that's the case, and I think that's a fair assumption. But does that mean you're able to go back to work? And does that mean that you're now going to have to have certification that you have antibodies that we don't know if they work? And then that's going to be a means that either manufacturers or employers are going to have to know about or test for or require. So that's going to be some really challenging decisions that people are going to need to make. That's in our future. Also, because he, I've heard that the tests are not reliable yet, the antibody tests. Well, actually, you're, again, you're, you're, you're dead on. Not only are the antibody tests not that reliable, then some of the tests for the COVID-19 itself are not that accurate. So you can have what's called a false positive or a false negative, meaning you have the disease and the test said, no, you didn't, or you don't have mm -hmm. the test or the disease and the test said you did. And there, we, we probably have all heard of people who've been to the ER, they've been into uh, medical situations and they've been tested and they said, oh, you don't have it, go home. And then they came back again or a third time and then they didn't test positive for the second or third visit. And that's mm -hmm. all too common and that's, Another lesson for today is if you think you have the, if the symptoms, you probably have the illness. It just takes mm -hmm. a while sometimes to confirm it. Okay. It's interesting. And how about the medicine that they're talking about, that they're touting? I forgot the name of it. Um, starts with a V or... Uh, so there's a, there's a number of different meds. I'll actually come back to that in a second. But yeah, there are a number of different options about antivirals or whether hydrochloroquine or zithromycin. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there was a lot of emphasis and, and hopeful um, publicity that they would work, and they don't. They really do not have the benefit. Um, yes, the, the Remivar, the antiviral, has some positive results that it might shorten the course, but there's also some studies that say it really had no impact. That being said, it would still be used if you were in a hospital, still be used in a setting. So there, it's, it's, it's in the treatment protocol and hydroxychloroquine and zithromycin was in the treatment pro protocol for a number of hospitals around the world. And there are some that are still using it because we really mm -hmm. don't have other options. So if you're, not at a if you're not at risk for some of its complications, you may still get those medications. But it mm -hmm. was at a point probably three weeks ago when people were trying to treat themselves at home and that really is not a good idea. That was- that no, was no, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. And how about the asymptomatic, you know, people that are asymptomatic, how do you feel about that? And how many, you know, why is that? And how, how, why is it that there's so many different symptoms now that they're saying that are showing up that are different than what they said you had to have a fever, but now people don't necessarily have to have any symptoms to have it. Yeah, it's, 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 we're all over the map. You can, every day you can read an article or, or listen to a presentation and you'll find different, differing information. I think they just did a study in Missouri where they tested a meatpacking staff and they found everybody was positive and nobody had symptoms. And then it was thought that maybe in Wuhan that it was maybe 20% or 60%. Clearly there is a large population in, this, in any country that has the disease and does not know it and that probably that same population is contagious to some degree. So the, the take home message for this and going ahead with, with where do you go for work and where do you go for school and mm. what do you do with social distancing, mm. is still you have to assume everybody has it. You have to be careful. Um, and unless yeah. you can prove that you don't, you've had it and you have the antibody or everybody has quarantined for 14 days, you have to assume that you have it, that they could have it well, or that anyone. Can I ask you a question, Chris? Because, for example, my, my family lives in uh, Louisiana and Georgia, so we're in the South. And, of course, Louisiana is one of the kind of ep the hot, you know, hot spots, the epicenters for the, for the virus. Georgia hasn't had that hard of a time, it, it sounds like. But I was wondering, do you think that we're opening, reopening too soon in individual states in the United States? Or, as my dad was kind of 
intimating some states really have not been hit that hard. So why crash the economy of the state if, if there's eight cases, right, or 20 cases? You know, how, what do you think about all this from a medical point of view? Well, there's, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of different examples of people who did it right and people who are doing it wrong. So Italy, for example, now is at the point where after a series of very tough weeks and months, you are now down to a number that we can track. And unfortunately, when you're trying to figure out where the disease is, so many people are asymptomatic and so many people are not tested, you can't take how many people have it as the meter for where you should open because so many people have it more than you'll never know. So unfortunately, you can actually check the number of deaths over a three week period because it takes three weeks for deaths to start to appear. And say, so if we haven't had deaths, a single digit day of deaths for three weeks in a row, then we know the number of people infected have actually gone down. But that is not the case. It is the case actually in Italy. We don't now. have a single digit of deaths here in Italy still, you know, after I, being quarantined for two full months. Right. I think your pro projection, projection, I think the um, University of Wisconsin, uh, Washington has done some very nice metrics and you are much closer to that date than we are. We are actually on the, still on the ups, upswing. So we think that we're, because we don't have a lot of cases and we're not testing, Georgia is on the way up, Louisiana is on the way up. Louisiana has actually some interesting results. They got bad news about the uh, Mardi Gras was a, was a place to spread a lot, but but what's different is for some reason, the big load didn't follow that in terms of cases. And they've had better success for those people who went to an intensive care unit, half of them lived. Whereas if you went to- You an know why? Care unit because city, four of my relatives in New Orleans are doctors. They are saving their life. I'm kidding. No, I'm not kidding. But, <laughs> but no, no, yeah, actually, no, it- <laughs> You're, you're <laughs> actually sorry, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> plug, my, plug my family there. <laughs> No, uh, you're you're absolutely right. They're actually they they were a little better prepared. There are major four major teacher hospitals, so they weren't as overwhelmed as New York City was. So they were able, and they were also after New York City, so they were able to learn from it. So so there are differences to where you are, but unfortunately, we are looking at areas and saying, oh well, this the the middle of the country doesn't have it. The middle of the country has it. We just haven't seen the big uptick in cases and deaths yet, but it's there. Just look at the, the numbers out of the meatpacking plants, nursing homes. It's, it's there. It's going to be, mm. unfortunately, and this is what's going to set us behind, is that for all the social distancing we've done in various areas, if you don't travel and you're all locked in your own state, then you can behave as a state, but we don't do that. Mm. Because we travel among, from state to state, one, one state being careful with social distancing and quarantine next to the state that is not means that it's going to bring the other state down. And those cases will spread around just like it did from China to other countries. They will spread back and reinfect areas. China was one of the first that says we don't want any travelers from Italy after they were starting to show some success. So it is very tricky. It is not as positive as we like to think in the United States. So, Chris, how do you, um, you know, take the personal responsibility and know, you know, it's state to state, everything is different, you know, depending on where you live. What can we do? What's your best suggestion as we, as you think this is probably going to be going on for a while or it's going to be around for a while? And I don't know where we are with vaccines. What's your best recommendation for all of us to, to because there's a lot of facts and fiction out there. And you listen to the news and then you hear a lot of people's opinions. And that's why we wanted you on today to kind of get more facts because there's a lot of different things going around. And I think people are confused of how to move into our, our new normal. Like what is the new normal? Is it staying home? Is it traveling? Is it not traveling? Um, and we, we know probably masks are gonna be involved in, in keeping the hi basic hygiene you know, principles. But what would you suggest for all of us? You hit on a lot of, of great questions in there, so I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna try. Pick what you want. <laughs> so, you, you you really have to you really have to plan that we still it's still everywhere. We are not to the point where you can say we've been socially distancing. The cases are fine. We are not um, whether you want to pick Sweden or or Germany, somebody who has better numbers. We're an unhealthy population. We are not. I mean, they were just showing pictures of the beachgoers in Miami and they had to close the beach and the parks because people were just ignoring it. 
So for now, I think you still have to assume it's everywhere. You still have to socially distance. And to be clear, socially distancing is not a preventive measure. It's a control measure. It does not mean you will not get sick. It means less of us will get sick. That was meant to blend the curves. People who are having social distancing parties and it's time to get play dates and the kids is, is a mistake. People are still gonna get sick. So like you're doing now, can you start branching out from where you've been in quarantine? Yes. Can you go to places like grocery stores where you can control the situation, you can clean the surfaces you're going to be touching? You can avoid people that you don't need to talk to by six feet or so on, and then wipe off or clean the various things that you bring. That is still a way to control it. And if you're going to take that out to go back into shopping or opening your store or so on, you can do the very same things. There's very good guidelines on the CDC on how to set those up, but we have to go slowly. But the idea that we're now back to uh, restaurants and let's gather and so on, we're not there yet. We are probably, at least in the United States, we're probably a good two months before we see the effects of what we're doing now. And I don't think it's going to be positive results. I actually think it's going to be discouraging. And I think this is going to carry through the summer because we're not following this as a group. Um, we're here. Well, in a situation, sorry, Chris. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, in a situation like the United States where it's kind of a, you know, each state is governing them, is making their own decisions on this, right? The governor of each state. Do you have any suggestions for people on how to move forward with this? I'm afraid I lost the second half. You lost of that me. I, you're right. I just saw that I was muted. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, and I and the, okay. and the states were at different, making different decisions, and that's a that's a whole other political decision discussion about why are the states acting independently and why are they fighting with who has. That's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Um, so but since you, it's being, you know, kind of governed by state by state, do you have any do you have any advice for people on while when when there's reopening, right? But it's kind of being put in your own hands in some ways. What is the best way to kind of put yourselves back out there into normal life, which of course is not normal anymore, and be cautious, but not be paranoid? You know, it's this really weird balance that none of us completely understand how to embrace yet. We in Italy reopened two days ago, but we didn't really reopen. <laughs> so anyway, right. I was curious what, you, what, you, what advice you have for us all. Well, there have been some, there have actually been some very good politicians in, in, in our country and, uh, and around the world who've had some very good steps on which, which are the organizations that you go to and what are the steps that you do to start breaking out and, and get back out in society. And so there's some things that, again, first the question, which is the same that happened before, is do you have to go? Do you have to travel? Do you have to open up that store? Do you have to go shopping? Do you really need another tattoo? Do you need your hair cut? Do you need your nails done? And I don't mean that, but it's, it's true. And for right now, I would say, no, you do not. The, the, the key factors for transmission of this illness are, is who's sick, how close are they to you, and how long are they exposing you to their illness? And that's the challenge. So do you go out? Yes. Do you bring gloves and means of cleaning whatever surfaces you may need to touch? Yes. Can you get and bring an N95 mask? Yes, you can. The face masks that most people are wearing are pretty much useless. They really do not filter out anything in terms of coming to you. What they do is they block maybe 10%. If you happen to be the one who's sick and you're coughing, will it help decrease the amount you spread? Yes. And as a comfort measure, it's a good idea. Its biggest benefit is it reminds you to keep your hands off your face because mm. what you still need mm. to do, you still need to wash your hands. And, and really 20 seconds is remarkably hard to do. So if you want some of the questions about what about people who want to go back to school or have to go back to work, watch your kids and see if they actually make 20 seconds of washing their hands. There's a bunch of studies that pick on the people who work in emergency rooms and nobody comes close to 20 seconds, even when they're reminded. You have to remember to wash your, clean off your, your credit card, your keys, whatever you touch on public, you still have to do probably at least, for us, I think it's going to be for a number of months. You may be closer in Italy to a month or so, but because we're, this is really a test time, I would, yeah. I would plan that it's really, I don't want to be the first wave out. 
I think there are already people who are being irresponsible at the first wave out. You want to be the cautiously optimistic, but careful when you go out. And that will also include who comes to visit you. So what else do you do? You have to think of how careful are you. And, and for those of us that have kids or teenagers mm -hmm. who are not as concerned or conscientious about who they're spending their time with, they are mm -hmm. potential risks. If you're healthy, it's not as big a deal, but if it's your parents, grandparents, and so on, you have to be concerned about who's spending time with who. And lastly, when you think about where you're going, the reason you keep that mask is and you don't want your hands on your face, and that's gonna make going out into public to eat particularly hard for a while. Yeah. And I would say until again, I would say at least four weeks until you get a sense of where these numbers are going, I wouldn't consider eating outside even even an outside deck on a windy day, I would say go with the takeout option until you have to. Get outside, enjoy yourself. There are very few cases where actually outdoor, well-ventilated transmission occurs. But okay. break that into the things we want to do. We want to go to the theater. We want to go eat. Those are going to be really hard to get back to. Chris, how about like hotels and things like that? Um, yeah, is it just uh, you know, stay away from that or, you know, traveling mm. in airplanes? I know that they have all these new, you know, precautions now where they're going to be fumigating the planes every 24 hours and, and masks. But do, would you trust that? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's not easily known. Um, so the first question is still going to be is, do you have to go for the next few weeks? After that's going to be where are you going and how are you traveling? And I've dealt with this for a number of clients and so on. And I think the airlines are actually remarkably good at the moment because the, air, air, um, the airlines themselves are almost empty. So when you get on the airplanes and there's four people, you're better off than going to the grocery store and you're gonna clean off your surfaces. I would say if you're traveling, I would have an N95 mask and I'd wear it the whole time. And 95 means it protects you from 95% of what you're up is that a question? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Not a question. Because we, you know, we, many of us in Italy are dying to go visit our families, you know, in, in England, in America, in Germany. And we, A, we're wondering in July, in August. So again, that's two months from now. Can we? Is that stupid? Is that okay? Is that safe? And I have two young children who will not keep their masks on. You know, they're, they're five and two, they will absolutely, there is no way they're gonna keep their masks on. They can't, they, I mean, the two-year-old can't, she physically can't. So what do you do? You just say, or do I just not travel? Wow. I, I think oh, we're yeah, gonna have a better sense of what the numbers look like in the next six weeks. So if it's the end of the okay. summer, I think go ahead and make the reservations. It looks like the airlines are actually pretty flexible about mm -hmm. rescheduling without charging you so that if you can't go, but if it's, if it's you and your husband and you can control the situation, then the risks are relatively small. When you mm -hmm. add the extra layer of your children who are not as easy to keep clean or keep, it's not gonna be as easy. And then you add the extra layer of going to visit an at-risk population, which just by age, your parents would be in. So you would have to get there and to really be safe, the only way is testing, because testing won't really help you unless you have to know you have antibodies you'd have to self quarantine for 14 days before you visit your parents. And I think, I think that's actually gonna still happen in, in August here. I don't know if that's gonna happen for you, but I think we're still headed for a rough summer. I think we're gonna to have to be mm. holding in many ways what we're doing, holding steady with various outbreaks of, of disappointing news. It, it has to be challenging for so many families who, you know, they've been quarantined with their children and they're ready to get out and, you know, see relatives oh, yes. and, and their, oh, we their miss vacations our... planned. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's going to yes. be challenging. Chris, I want to do um, a follow up on that. What does quarantine look like? Like right now, do you have any idea, like when you travel, who suggests, who says you need to quarantine you? Is it the police? Is it, and is it enforced? I mean, obviously it should be on my responsibility to do it out of respect for everyone around me. I completely agree with that. But I was just curious, what does it, a quarantine actually look like? So quarantine is really a, just a, a phase of separation from others for 14 days and it's self-imposed. Mm -hmm. That being said, that it looks like the airlines and immigration and so on are trying to figure out how do they screen incoming uh, travelers. So there may be some issues where you're, they'll do a forehead temperature check, which unfortunately mm -hmm. is almost useless, but they still may be doing it. 
or they may even ask for certification that you have antibodies. And there even there is there are dogs that they're training that can spell coronavirus. Wow, so that's you fascinating. Have to, you literally that's have amazing. to go through a dog sniffing line that who knows by August that may be the issue. But the quarantine then won't be imposed by anybody but you. And it means if your parents okay. have a, a large enough house and you can live separately in the same house, that's what self-quarantine would mean. It means you don't, you don't exchange, you don't interact in any way you, that isn't protected by a mask or gloves and so on. And ideally, the other side of a piece of glass would be best because unfortunately it is so devastating, particularly in the older population. That's not the trip you want to have. You know, you go all that way, and then if somebody gets sick, it it, it could just be devastating. So, yeah, um, I, I I would think what would be what would be likely is that I would be I would not be planning on going anywhere with small kids to see your parents. I'm just I don't think that's going to happen. The 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 big answer everybody is looking for is will there be a vaccine, and. There are encouraging results out of Oxford and England and AstraZeneca, the big uh, British drug maker, is jumping on board. That, that company was ahead of the game because they've been studying coronavirus immunization for a number of years. So that means, not the company, but that the Oxford group, because they're, they're ahead of the game, they've been studying safe means of introducing viruses for humans. So they, they have a leg up. Doesn't mean they'll have the answer, but they are ahead of the curve for everybody else. The other good news is that there's so much attention, so many intelligent people, and now every academic institution, every research group is trying to find it. But it's a it's a tall order to get a vaccine that is usable for the entire population. You're going to probably need a single dose. It probably can't be refrigerated. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge. But they've already started vaccinating. Uh, uh, volunteers to start the early early research for how this works. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, interesting. That, that I know so many people are looking forward to some some resolution or some hope. So, Chris, I know that we're kind of opening up um, some questions to our audience, mm. and um, yeah. it's been fascinating um, to hear your perspective on this. And I've learned so much myself. And what kind of hope can you give the audience right now to be a little more optimistic? Because people have had such an array of emotions over this fear, um, and we want we want to give them some kind of hope, you know, um, to move on to their new normal, whatever that's going to be for for the next what, couple, few months to six months to a year, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that I think the hope is that for those, like I said, there are so many intelligent, kind, thoughtful, philanthropic groups that are looking for options. There are innovations on how do we figure out even um, electronic means of social distancing. How are we going to tr come up with new treatments or new options for how do we share food and so on. I think there are ways that this is going to be easier and and I, would, I wish the worst was over. I'm, I'm afraid that for certain parts of the world, that's not the case. So I think we are learning a lot and people are sharing information and there are so many dedicated people and it, it, healthcare world is obvious one to, to, to look at, but really in terms of who's supporting your life as we go on, there are a lot of people who are going out of their ways for others. And that I think is the most encouraging news that we have. And, and I do think it's one of those positive things and whatever you can do to be part of that. And the other one is what are you doing now? What is different that you get to have that was going to change? And like somebody uh, commented earlier is, you know, in whatever number of months or years, we're all going to wish we didn't have to go to work and we could stay home. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't probably have small kids in an apartment for a week. <laughs> right, you know, exactly. Find whatever that positive angle is, is, yeah. is really, you know. And the other one is, what else, what else have you been dying to do? I don't care, writing, reading, something that you don't typically do, um, that you can do now that, that you will not get to sometime soon. So those are the most positive things I can think of at the moment. Thanks, Chris. Uh, those are great suggestions. Um, Elliot, did you have another question before we yeah, open it to because, our, our audience? Well, actually, I was going to read one of the one of the audience's questions that came in. They said, "What can we trust on the news? How do we know what is real and what isn't?" 
<laughs> Do you want to take a second for that, Chris? <laughs> that is a difficult question. So I, I, I will tell you, I, I do listen to, um, I like to get two or three sources for whatever I'm looking for. So um, I do, I strongly believe in the World Health Organization and the CDC. These are people who are so unbelievably smart and have dedicated their entire lives to things I can barely understand. This is what they've trained for. And so I, I still believe that their recommendations that they update every day on the CDC are great places as a foundation. I do think that it's an important factor for the news organizations and certain health organizations. Um, there's, I, I listen to certain infectious disease groups. I listen to certain news mm. organizations. And I try and put together a, a mixture of those issues. And the one time or the second time report I, I, I think you have to be careful about. I think the bigger issue with what people are, are following is that they're getting too much news. You know, if you're yes. following every story and this and that, and the news is on all day, I think that has a bigger impact. There mm -hmm. is not a lot of brand new news every day. There's a lot of theatrics right. and there's a lot of politics. There's not a lot of new news. And I don't think, so I think that the, the you know, sort of almost like limiting your screen time, you have to limit your news time to a certain part of the day or whichever you do, and then turn it off because it's, it's completely overwhelming. What, what are your trusted, what would you say are trusted, you know, avenues for getting information that you feel confident about as far as, you know, I know that you go to those certain organizations you talked about, but for the general public, is it just... I've, I mean, I, I do. I do like certain newspapers. I like the Washington Post. I think they have some great writing. I like the New York Times. Um, I I actually like certain areas on Twitter that you can get little snippets from certain um, authors or or reporters that you like, and you can sort of screen through on. Are there a couple sentences in there that I find interesting? And that's what I will, will still follow my two dozen, three dozen people that I either enjoy or I trust what they have to say. I can't say, there, there are, I mean, there are some really good politicians out there. They're not very senior politicians, but there are some very good politicians. Um, I think it's Katie Porter in, in California. I mean, there's some just really smart, smart people. And so I, I do think there's some great leadership going on, but um, I, you have to be careful about where you pick it out. And what what's kind of what's behind the, the motivation? Mm -hmm. I think that's wise. I, very I wise. Had a, I had a question from from here in Florence, um, from an American mom who, of course, has an Italian um, husband and, and son. She said, "Do you have any tips on how schools and summer camps? Because they're talking about maybe, maybe doing some summer camps in July that would be you know in the open air and with the possibility of doing some kind of social distancing." like with tennis or something, you know. Um, do you have any tips on how schools, perhaps in September and summer camps, can prepare their campuses for summer or fall reopening, guaranteeing safety, health safety? Guaranteeing is a tricky word. Um, mm. I think there are a lot of steps and um, that, that you can go to the CDC or the World Health. There are a lot of really important steps, and I, I can mention a few, and you've mentioned a few already, yeah. is that, you know, how clean are the surfaces that they're working at? How well are they screening the students coming back? How are they distancing where they'll be staying? The biggest issue is going to be, one, where do they eat? Because the real risk factor is always anything that you get on your hands, you take, and if you're eating, um, any kind of exposure from someone who is sick and didn't know about it is really going to be the risk. And that's going to be the problem with going to those. So um, coming back to, say, summer camp, the issue is if it's a, a small camp with incredibly conscientious crew that are, in some ways, honestly, um, are you checking for antibodies and so on? Because it's going to be so hard if they've quarantined and you know they've been near nobody have exposure for two weeks before they start the session but you're assuming that everyone is doing that and unfortunately by the time if someone's really sick it's going to be very hard in a camp setting with kids to ensure that there's a guarantee of health it's just it's going to be near impossible i think this summer so and if you're go ahead oh chris sorry to interrupt how about hand sanitizers? Are those, I heard there's kind of a myth about the, that they are really killing every, all the germs or all the, the virus. 
Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Number one, um, washing your hands for 20 seconds is the ultimate, without a okay. doubt. Doesn't matter what temperature, soap, liquid soap is best, is without a doubt the best. The only reason hand sanitizers need to be at least 90%, uh, excuse me, 60% alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of companies, there are a lot of groups that are trying to come out with new options that haven't been proven to work. And again, mm -hmm. I would say the CDC has a list that either you can make your own or which are approved products. And the same would go if you're trying to clean off your surfaces, the same would go with what are the approved surfaces that actually have an impact on COVID-19 and they're listed by brands or contents on the CDC site. So okay, I, I would refer those, okay. but I would remind you that when you go to disinfect a surface, you have to leave the disinfectant on there for about a minute or two before you clean it off. And that's oh. not usually sort of shared in the information. So no. it's, it's it, going to be a very unusual summer and the fall is going to be very difficult to get yeah. back to a student setting unless there is some great breakthrough mm. in terms of how much antibodies actually in the population or a mm. vaccine. But otherwise, we're not going to be that much different than where we are right now, which is a lot of unknowns. Mm -hmm. There's a couple questions coming in. Thanks, Chris. Um, there's a couple questions coming in before we need to wrap up. So, um, Elia, you can maybe help me with some of these, but sure. um, one, one I don't know where this person was, but do you think there will be a second wave? I do. I think the second wave is going to be a couple of weeks that we we're going to see areas. There, there's a couple answers to that. There's going to be a second wave in certain areas for the United States. There are going to be areas that are near either the meatpacking or the prisons or the nursing homes and the surrounding areas, mm -hmm. areas in the Midwest that have been remarkably low in numbers that are now spiking out of control. And those mm -hmm. are going to be, in a way, our first early second wave. But I think that the fall is, is going to have another recurrence because just it's, it, we haven't eradicated it and it's, it's, they're, they're looking for certain issues. For example, there's an article today about Israel and they're looking for her, herd immunity. So if you have a certain population percentage, 60, 70 percent that are already infected, then you can go safely thinking that because they're all protected, mm. you're less likely to get it. The reality is we're nowhere near 50 or 60 percent of the populations infected. We're closer to maybe 5, 10, 15 percent. So if we're not protected, we're going to sort of keep reinfecting ourselves. It's going to go to areas of developing nations in Africa. And, and then with travel, it's, only, it's going to come back. And then we're going to let our guard down and we're going to be mm -hmm. back in the same. So I'm, let me put it this way. I'm worried we're going to have a second wave. Okay. I don't know if we will, but I am worried we're going to have it. And that's why I think the school in the fall is, is, is tentative at best. Okay. Well, so all of the audience out there, um, I, if you have any more questions for Chris or uh, Dr. Sidford, Chris, yeah, do you have another one. question, Elia? Okay, great. Well, we had, one, we had one that was, I thought, rather lovely. Well, lovely. It's, it's sensitive. What do you recommend for the elderly to do to protect themselves in this, you know, second, second wave, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the idea that they've already been staying at home for this long, they've already been, been, you know, using masks and everything. They just keep doing that. I, I think I, in many ways they're going to keep needing to do that. I, I don't see any, any real preventative that's, that's going to happen. There's not going to be a safe place to go. There aren't safe towns. I mean, Park City, unfortunately, is an example of where people took off from the large cities and said, oh, let's go to a resort town and this will be a safer place. And now they had one of the largest outbreaks in numbers. So I don't think there's going to be a, a, a better place to be. So if they're in a place they're comfortable, so you can, I think the step for them is, is, is to be like they are now. How did they say, what did they bring in the house? How do they protect themselves in terms of either the food or what do they get? And how do they limit their exposure when they go out of the house, pharmacies, um, there are places, for example, in the United States, there, there are groups like PillPack that can ship your medications to you. Mm. They're getting better at telemedicine, so you don't have to go visit your physician. Mm -hmm. to deliver your prescriptions. That may be the case for the fall. I'm hopeful that we are not in that, but I'm afraid that, that we have to prepare that that's going to happen and then be unbelievably uh, joyous if it doesn't. I, lo I love that, Chris. I mean, my mother's uh, in a memory care facility, and it's been really stressful for us because 
on, on one hand, because we can't see her, and but it, on the other hand, we know that she's safe and they haven't had any cases there. But when we look into the future, we think, well, how long is it going to be before she can really see anybody? And and they're vigilant on anybody coming in or out or any 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 products coming in and out. Everything is is wiped down, and so we're right. very very thankful for that. But moving into the future, you know, we don't know how long that's going to be, but. I guess that's the silver lining. They they are taking extra measures for those those people, especially in memory care or, or facilities, long term care, which is. I know we need to wrap it up, but I actually would love to know, Chris, your opinion, being a doctor, on you know the long term effects on children, parents, and and the elderly of not being able to see their friends, their teachers, their family members. You know the the psychological effects on that. We're going to have some serious side effects, aren't we? I mean, we talked with Renee Saint Jock last week. With last week, as a psychologist about trauma. I mean, do you agree that there will be some really serious long term uh, effects of this? Yeah, there's a couple things, Terry. I just wanted to come back to your question. Is one of the things about the fall that might be interesting is that the areas that were so devastated, like nursing homes, may be in a way protected because those who survived may have been contracted and may have antibodies so in a weird way oh. they may mm. actually be in a weird safe spot because of that so that's yeah. one quick side i'm not sure they're going to feel that way in the prisons which are struggling but that's right. a weird way yeah. in terms of the impact yes there is there's just there's i i don't think it's so much we, we are very very much a social um species and we we underestimate how important that is to us um i i I'm not in the position to say how big the impact, but without a doubt, it's going to affect all of us. Um, it's also the fact that your kids or all of us are, are living in the unknown. We don't really understand what's out there and it's very hard to, to, to understand what that means. I mean, we grew up, or I grew up, um, when we, they were doing nuclear tests and you had to hide under your desk in school and we couldn't figure out what, what that meant. And so there, there are various things that affect us, but this is so prolonged and so compelling. It's always on the news. It's in the conversation that we hear. So the, 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 the hope there is that you are the um, champion of the cause. You are protecting them from over-information. You are being the positive impact that there are th certain things that are going to push them. And there are, there are times to get help. There are times to, to turn off. There are times to talk there are times to get out and get exercise or times to do meditation whatever the things are this is an opportunity for you to be the teacher and and even when we're the ones who are equally pushed or more pushed we still are the protector so it's still our role to figure out ways to find work your way into questions they do or don't want to answer or have that you may not know about so it's also an opportunity, but yes, you're absolutely right. It is going to be a, an impact, and I'm hoping that we are, we are going to have more positive news that we can come out of this and say, remember when we couldn't, now we get to. So that's my... Right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you really Thank have you given us so, so much, so much great information today. I know we um, could go on for hours and hours about this. I, we would love to have you back. We wish you and your family health and wellness and, and happiness mm -hmm. and everyone out there as well. And uh, we will have, uh, we will be able to answer the questions that people um, went, that typed in that we did not have time to answer today. And we will have another Bring Our World Together with COVID-19 next Wednesday, one o'clock Mountain Standard Time in the United States, nine o'clock Italy. And our guest will be Lonnie Main, and he will be talking about igniting the human potential during this unprecedented time and our new normal. So, and he's also the founder of Red Shoe Living. So turn in next week, and we really thank all of you for tuning in. And thank you, Chris, so much for being our guest. And Elia, thank you for, for helping out and uh, asking all the wonderful questions from Italy. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Elia. Very nice to meet you, and Terry, great to see you. And uh, Good to see you. And uh, grazie. Thank you very much. You as well, thank Chris. You. Thanks for everything you're doing for all of us out there. We really appreciate it. Uh, we really do. Pleasure. Great to talk to you. Thank okay. you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.